size of the, the sample. And uh, so basically, if you have large samples, you're going to have more people at the extreme than if you have a small uh, sample. So I believe that's COVID-1980, but uh, uh, they tend more often than boys to attribute their success to luck. So Anya is not, not much of a, he's not a former chess professional, yeah. um, but he's a st very strong in statistics. And uh, you, maybe you have, you remember there was one study mentioned uh, in, uh, by uh, Fernand, by Marin Bilalic. Marin Bilalic was the doctoral student of Fernand, and he was the supervisor of Nemanja. So Marin brought Nemanja to uh, look at chess data, uh, and um, so I'm his grandfather. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's correct. Right. Yes. <laughs> okay, here you go. That's absolutely co correct. And I think that at one moment I was essentially in my presentation, I was saying, um, well, my idea was to continue the research that started with Binet, continue with the good, and then with Fernand here, Merriman, and then I'm hopefully trying to add something, something in additional to this, to this body of research that is there. So um, I'm going to talk about some of the research on the, on the questions of, of cognitive processes that was done um, using chess data. Mainly I'm going to focus on, on some of my research where I was investigating how chess uh, players age and how experts really age. This was the, the main, main underlying topic of my research. I didn't do a lot of gender differences there. Um, I only have one figure um, that is naturally profound um, or doesn't add anything new to the discussion that is already complex because I focus on a completely other beast of a question with, which was this interaction between the nature versus nurture and that in itself was complex and controversial enough for me to say that I, I'm not going to deal with the gender differences on top of that. So. So there is a huge history, as you can see, of utilization of chess, chess game, in the case of, of many different domains of research. We have in, in linguistics, where the uh, rules of, of, so to say, chess were used to illustrate how we build language and how we combine the rules of, of language. We have emerging properties in the organ complex physics where, where this emergent behavior from simple rules and elements into the complex systems was again um, um, used to, to illustrate with the chess and there is of course huge amount of information or huge amount of history in the computer science where chess being held as a, as a holy grail for computer science brought so many differences in what we think about the artificial intelligence, what we think about how we observe the chess game, and so on. And the reason for that was that we have clear-cut rules, well-defined environment in the case of chess, that when combined is really complex enough that um, um, Shannon would say there are more, more moves and more options in the case of chess game than there are um, atoms in the universe. So in the psychology or in cognitive sciences now then we can take this game, um, manipulate the elements in the game and see how that changes the outcomes and the behaviors and measure reaction time and anything that was telling us about the uh, perception, memory and reasoning um, on the one side that are purely, so to say, uh, let's say lower level uh, cognitive uh, processing and then activity, deliberate practice and accumulated knowledge that is, that is so to say, everything that we get with inter when we interact with the environment and we, when we learn new things. What I was mostly um, focused on or what I like the most about this environment, it has a really reliable measure of skill that is sometimes not uh, always stable or not always uh, estimated the best for different age groups, but at least we have a really good approximation of how good people are in the domain and this gives us possibility to, to quantify the skill, to compare uh, people with different skills, skill level and so on. What I like the, the chess the most about is that it was always um, uh, related to this idea of extraordinary cognitive ability. People that are good at chess, they are, they are highly intelligent, they are, uh, they, they are good strategists and so on. And this was held, as I said, as a holy grail in computer sciences where we had this huge, huge uh, push to, to 
teach the computer how to play chess and, and beat Gary or, or now to build this Alpha Zero and Alpha Go engines that can maybe approximate a bit better how, what we think, how cognitive processes work in the people, playing huge amount of games against itself with this Alpha Go that does or Alpha Zero and then learn through these iterations. Two weeks ago there was a new paper that came out that now changed slightly these models and added um, additional layers, uh, so to say, neural level, neural, neural networks that uh, first try to find the best uh, value function, how to, what is the most optimal to learn in a game, and then first to understand what is the, the feedback loop, what is reinforcement clue for me, whether I'm playing good or not, and then go and try to learn the, the tree of possibilities and how to find the optimal answer in now in that, that game. So now you will be able to use AlphaGo um, on Atari games, or to say computer games, and, and you can run the neural network, and the neural network will try to learn what is the best outcome there, and, and then try to, try to beat itself over the time. So this is probably the, the, why I find these, these developments amazing because we, we are making such, a, such, a, such algorithms that we might end up understanding more and more about cognition. It's really still far-fetched, but we are getting towards some of these results. Um, most of my work was done on the archival approaches, essentially on using this huge amount of data that we have about the player's performance, about the structured um, uh, records that, that um, for every game that, that you play, um, going several decades back. And my idea was that I can now use some of the statistical methods to try to see what, what is in that data, to try to maybe replicate some of the effects that were there, um, uh, shown in experimental approach, and, and maybe unravel some new effects that might be, again, um, uh, replicated in the experimental approaches. So what I focused most on was the age-related changes of performance, effects of activity, intelligence, and I said there are gender differences, but let's, let's see. Um, okay, so what I was mostly following, like a general perspective, is the lifespan psychology. Uh, Father Adolf Petalet, a Flemish scientist who said, man, man is born, grows up, and dies according to some certain laws. And he was always saying uh, that the, the growth does not stop when we reach adulthood. Once we reach the peak, we, we, we don't stop growing. There are some certain aspects that always develop, even then there, there are some um, declines in, in other aspects. So development and aging are interwoven together. And when we see the results, really, um, in the case of fluid abilities, how fast we are um, in, in memory, in processing and in reasoning, that always declines with the age. So if you measure by the different um, uh, measurements of, of fluid abilities, as we age, um, the, the older we get, the slower we, we tend to be. And this is maybe not surprising, and we can all see that every additional year, um, I, I tend to be much slower. Uh, this presentation was much faster <laughs> three years ago. <laughs> so, in the case of crystallized abilities, uh, we have an opposite effect. So, we always, and crystallized abilities then essentially tell us how much we know about the world and about the environment that we are dealing. And this always increases. So, a good example is the, the vocabulary or the mental lexicon, how many words we know. And that always increases as, as we age. We rarely forgot the words that we learned. Um, and we always, because we go into more environments in our life, we just learn new words. There are some certain declines that you can expect, expect if, in, in the case of. Um, uh, maladaptive diseases that affect the brain and so on, but in a general normative aging, you would not expect that you are falling into crystallized abilities uh, at least until 80, 90 years old. So there, the results are not so stable, and there are not so many studies investigating what happens as, as we age in the real life performance, and you would usually see this 
um, increase and decrease function that was probably fitted because there was not a lot of data inside um, all of those, those studies and uh, people were not so much interested in what was happening with the shape of the function. So you would have an increase to the peak, for example, in baseball, and then decrease after it. This is chess. You would have an increase um, um, for the younger people and then decrease for the, for the older people. So this was one of the main aspects that I focused on um, using chess databases with the engine and creating a new rating so, system. Uh, so that would be an ideal situation where we can, th that was one of my ideas to, to really uh, run, run the individual moves through the, through the engine system. Yeah, so working can, on it and you develop can, some new rating system. Yeah, because you can quantify the entropy of a, of a board at all times and you can qualify, quantify the movements of course and then see how the entropy changes depending on the, on the age. Um, because an interesting thing with the chess game, it would be like a reverse type of entropy. You don't want to you don't want to decrease the entropy of this system necessarily immediately, but keep it keep it that it has that you have m moves possible to to play, not necessarily restrict the number of moves and so on. So this would be an interesting thing to investigate. Uh, what we were thinking with this, because we, in this analysis we have around one hundred thousand chess players. So that these um, your domain is very big. Yeah, yeah. So that these factors are gonna are going to 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 well, let's say uh, uh, that, no, that the signal is going to be much stronger than the noise in the data. Of course, if there are systematic biases, this is not going to happen. And if there are some certain systematic uh, variables that are influencing the the performances and so on they are just going to be inherently problematic there. So I'm going to show later some interactions with the intelligence, which is then a systematic factor that does influences or the practice and so on. Uh, but yes, absolutely. Of the players, um, you have number of games played per year um, on the tournaments, and then the yellow rating is in the, in the colors there. Um, uh, warmer colors are, are higher yellow, and colder colors are the lower yellow. And it's like a hiking map, so easy lines will tell you how fast the things change, these, these red lines. So you can see that in the beginning, like, the more people play, the, the ELO rating just, just um, jumps um, um, immediately. We find something that we call expertise window, so to say, from middle of the 20s or beginning of the 20s to, to mid-30s, end of 30s. Uh, people that play a, a lot, um, they, are, they are highly likely to, to reach, or these people are reaching the, the level of high expertise. Um, this is not so, so frequent, or it's not an average in the case of younger people. But what I like the most with the aging is that people that are highly active in the older age, they preserve their, their ill of scores. So they are always really good in that domain. The intelligence. So this is only on 90 chess players in the Ossian uh, um, system, for which we uh, measure numerical, verbal, and figural intelligence. And then we try to see how that uh, interacts with the with the practice measured by the tournament activity, and to see whether these these um, measures of intelligence really do something on the low performance. And you would see that figural intelligence does not do um, uh, anything. So their being higher on the figural intelligence doesn't help you to be to have a higher ELO rating, which uh, is again in connection to finance presentation. Finance presentation, um, figural intelligence would, would measure or approximate these mental rotations, but it seems that this does not play a huge role in the ELO perform in the performance. <coughs> Verbal intelligence plays a role. So the, the higher the higher verbal it, the intelligence is, the, the higher the rating is going to be of, of the chess players. And the numerical intelligence enters like a complex interaction with, with age and practice. So this is numerical intelligence, this is the practice. Um, so if you look at this figure, uh, all of the people, depending on their, their score, 30 would be uh, 100 EQ points in the numerical intelligence, 55 would be 122 EQ points, if I'm not mistaken. All of the people profit from just playing more games. 
um, everyone, everyone improves, everyone learns. It's a bit more stronger effect for the higher able players, but everyone, everyone profits from just being an active, active in domain. As we age, this gets uh, more and more uh, 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 problematic. So in this case, only well, in the when the, when the people are 35, so higher able players always profit, while the less able players they at one moment so to say, stabilizing their improvements, they reach the asymptote level. They don't get anything from playing more games. And this is the most drastic in the case of uh, in the old age, where you have that only highly capable players, only extremely active players, are still amazing in the domain. They are still on the same level of 2,000, 2,100 points, or even at the level of, of, of extremely performing uh, um, um, professional, while the less able players, they don't get almost anything from just just being active in the, in the domain. Mm -hmm. So you need to say, okay, if I know that these are my uh, space of possible moves, um, I, I need to evaluate every move and see where I am numerically in, in this system. So, so it seems that the numerical intelligence adds on this third level of phase. I assess the problem, I, I go into the simulation in my mind eye, what are the possible moves, and then I do calculations on top of that moves to see where it puts me if I play that move out. Um, and, and it seems that numerical intelligence might also add directly to, to this, this way to the, to the game of chess. They, are, they have higher ELOs. So this is again telling you something that there is some to the numerical in intelligence there. But to, to essentially conclude, um, I focus mostly on this longitudinal data set um, as a way to <coughs> add something new to, to what Fernand and Mary did with experimental approaches and to, to see whether we can utilize this data. Um, it seems that we can. It seems that there is a wealthy amount of information there. Just this discussion of whether we are using a rating or, or rating performance or, or whether we can wait now this rating is, is a huge amount of psychometric type of research that we can, we can do. Um, but we can also see these effects as in the case of aging. Um, chess approximates nicely the complexity of the real life skills that can tell us about, about the, what we want to know, really how to stop how to understand uh, what happens with the society as we age. Interaction of our crystallized abilities. We are probably, if we are really good at the domain, if we are really focused, um, going to preserve our functioning in that domain and that even in the 70s and 80s, you, people would be able to contribute to their domain of, of specialization, uh, even though there are huge amount of declines that you would expect in the speed of processing, in the, in the general speed of, of movement and so on. So um, I, I believe that this is a, a positive aspect. And then on the game of chess, I, I find this interaction of intelligence and practice in, interesting because it shows, um, again, that, that the intelligence is important, but cannot be just taken as, as a single factor. We cannot just focus on it saying, you know, everything is due to intelligence. The models we get, uh, I think with, with just intelligence in age, 17% uh, of explained variance, so to say, uh, with, uh, once we add this complex interaction, age, intelligence, um, uh, practice, we get up to 47, I think, percent of, of variance or almost 50% 50, 50 of variance. Depending on the measure that you use, you will get from 40 to, to 50, 50 something, and then how clear it is, and so on. So, so it, it, is, it, is, it is an important factor, but it, it cannot be taken as a single factor. That, that, that was the main thing. So more social, so it's like a five against five. Mm -hmm. You still have a male predominant environments. Mm -hmm. the, the females that are playing those games, tend to uh, take roles that are more uh, protective, less aggressive, and then um, you just cannot, they don't survive in the system at all. They are immediately eaten by this male aggressive. Um, so point I thought maybe it was like a ghetto, like that the problem is simply the numbers. That uh, Well, like 
when it suddenly in Denmark becomes 98 to 2 percent, even if women should theoretically fit in, just because yeah, yeah, the yeah. imbalance always there, it, it's gonna yeah, yeah. enlarge the, the problem. Yeah, right? so that's really a problem. But, yeah. but sort of with hormones, could you just, I mean, measure the hormone level in strong female players? And uh, yeah, you, yeah, there was that, a study. Okay. I, I think it was only with the males where they measured the level of uh, testosterone in the yeah, yeah. after players win the game, it's very high and okay. so forth. Yeah.